All right, hello everyone. Welcome to day two of OT with DA. We are live on Instagram and we are uploading to YouTube. So welcome, my name is Pastor David Ashrick. And for those of you that are on the Instagram live here, we have, we've moved you to the table. So consider that an upgrade, all right? Con consider that an upgrade. Now you get to be right on the table with me Hopefully the audio is better and the video is better and I won't be continually uh, looking off uh, axis at the camera or the, the phone. So welcome everybody. Super glad that you are joining us. We've already got almost 300 people live on Instagram. Day two of OT with DA. Welcome everybody. I'll just say hi to a few people here. Hello D Winter 2 b Hey, Sylvia, great to see you. Kendra, love you, sister. Haven't seen you in a long time. Hey, Jim, great to see you. Jen, hello. Deb, hello. Deborah, hello. Chuck Baby 7 from Alexandria, Virginia. Oh, I like it. Here we go again, says Rachel. Agree. Hi, Katie. Hi, Melba Toast. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Gabby Abby. Man, I love saying that. D Casper. Man, I was just texting you a few minutes ago, and here you are. Here you are. All right, Stephen Farr, love you, brother. Christian Martin, my main man. Hannah, love you so much. You're a little late to the party. I'm accustomed to you being one of the first on, and you're letting the side down here. All right, Joe, great to see you. D. Will Gillespie, D. Jordan, Mrs. Hungate. I love it. All right, welcome, everybody. We are on day two of DA with DA. Uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, sort of remind you what we covered yesterday very briefly. Hey, Rich, great to see you. Jose, L West Q. So basically what we're doing is very similar to what we did with DA with DA. I am going live on Instagram right here, right here on the table. You got the upgrade. This is first class right here. <laughs> Hello from Montana, S-C-R-N-J-T. And then what we do is about an hour after the Instagram live is done, I go uh, to over here to the computer and we push a few buttons and pull a few levers and we upload to YouTube. Um, so that's the way it's gonna go. And we are on day two of our 75 day challenge titled OT with DA. And what that means is the Old Testament with David Asherick. And uh, if you're wondering who David Asherick is, that's me, I'm David Asherick. And this is the Old Testament, okay? It's actually the New Testament as well, but we'll be there in just a little bit. Okay, a few quick um, sort of announcements just to catch everybody up to speed. I won't always do these, um, but a few things that are very important. As I said yesterday, um, it's funny, I, I actually went back and watched the video uh, last night, uh, late last night. I watched the whole video just to see how it looked and how it sounded, and I think it sounded pretty good actually. I was, I was really blessed and a big shout out to Jim, uh, maybe a, another big round of digital applause to Jim who's in the room again. Um, but it, it's all come off really well and it was very cool to see it uh, on YouTube and the quality, the audio and video quality on YouTube is A+. plus. So thank you, Jim, you're a legend. Um, but what I was saying is, is, is basically uh, as I, was watching last night, I noticed that I was talking about the discount code and 10% off and upgraded free shipping, and I never even mentioned the website. That's how bad I am at marketing. I, 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 it's like I get all the details and I forget the main thing. And the main thing is that the website is typesandsymbols.store. So typesandsymbols.store, if you wanna get your hands on uh, a copy of The Conflict Beautiful, or these amazing journals. If you use the OT with DA discount code between now and January 23, then you get 10% off, free upgrade shipping, yada, yada, yada. So I forgot to say that last night and apologies. Um, also, we are going live today where I'm at, at I think it's uh, five o'clock. Tomorrow night, we will be live again in the evening. And as I've already mentioned, typically we will go in the mornings but for this first few days, maybe even the first week, we'll be largely in the um, evenings just because it allows us time to troubleshoot and to make sure that we've got all of our eyes 
dotted and our T's crossed. So tomorrow night will be six o'clock mountain time. So one hour later than we are tonight. So apologies for the inconsistency, but again, until we get all these technical things figured out, it, it just is what it is. Again, if you can't make the lives, no problem. Uh, you can just watch it on YouTube, okay? Easy. Let's see, what else do I have to tell you? Oh, okay, so some really cool things. Um, first of all, one of the best things about DA with DA when we did it was that we had a lot of guests. And I've had so many people say to me, David, we loved DA with DA, but we especially loved it when you would have on guests. And I had on some amazing guests. Chris, uh, let's see, who did I have on there? I was about ready to say Christian Martin, but, but he was never on. Um, let's see, D Casper, that's who I was thinking of. D Casper, Nathan Renner, Jennifer Schwerzer, um, Jamie Houghton. Um, there's a lot of great people that I'm forgetting, for which I apologize. Um, so anyway, that was one of the real blessings of the DA with DA was that we had guests. And now that we have a studio, I can't just be traveling to a hotel in Salt Lake City or a, a school in Pennsylvania or, or Jen's house in Florida. So what I'm gonna try and do is get as many, Nathan Renner was on the program. What I'm gonna try and do is get as many of these people as possible to come here, to come visit me. And today I spoke to one, two, three, four people and uh, they're arranging their schedules and we're working on flights and great news. Um, several of them have already confirmed. Ty Gibson already confirmed for the toward the end, uh, sometime in, I think it'll be like the first week of March, but we are going to have our first guest this Friday, this Friday. And uh, she will be with us for several days and that is none other then one of my favorite people on earth, one of my wife's favorite people on earth, Jennifer Jill Schwerzer. And uh, she's gonna be with us starting on Friday and for several days after that. And I should say, Dr. Jennifer Jill Schwerzer, since she was last on the program, she's now finished up her education doctorate and she's gonna be here. And we've got a lot of great stuff to talk about, which is the second thing I wanna tell you. Not only are we going to have guests, but one of the things that it just, one of the things that I became really persuaded about when we started talking about OT with DA, I was like, there's a lot of issues in there that kind of emerge and questions that emerge that are just big, tough, difficult questions. Like for example, today we'll be talking about the origin of evil, the existence of evil, the rebellion of Lucifer. I mean, these are big, big questions, questions of theodicy and questions of justice. And there's a lot of those kinds of questions that come up in the Old Testament. I mean, the Old Testament's an old book. It's not a book, it's, it's, a, it's a series of books. It's more than, it's almost 40 books. And one of the things I wanna do in OT with DA is I want to have supplemental sessions. Okay, so we're gonna have the 75 sessions every day, a chapter, so we did the intro, 73 chapters, and then we'll have the grand finale. But one of the really cool things that I wanna do is I wanna bring in people that I love, that I have a lot of confidence in, to talk about specific issues that come up in the Old Testament. So for example, I wanna bring in one of my very close friends, one of the brightest, most intelligent, most well-read, most educated people that I know to talk about creation and the flood and the geological, biological, anthropological evidences for creation and the flood. And obviously that's gonna be outside of the scope of what we can do in a devotional exercise. And so I reached out to my good friend, Dr. Sean Pittman today, and I said, hey, Sean, would you be willing to come on and we'll, we'll do an hour or two hour or whatever it turns out to be conversation, and then that can be supplemental material to OT with DA. He said, yeah, great, let's do it. So we're gonna lock that in. Also, this coming Saturday, Jen and I will do some supplementary material, and this is gonna be, it's gonna be really good, very important, but probably a little bit controversial, honestly. We're gonna be talking about male-female relationships, marriage, gender roles, uh, we're going to talk about the nature of the fall and how the nature of the fall impacted gender roles and what does it mean, wives submit yourselves to your husbands and what's taking place there in the curse in Genesis. And again, these are great, big, important conversations that Jen, 
Dr. Jennifer Jill Schwerzer, I should say, has done a whole lot of study on, thinking on, writing on, reading on, and she said, I wanna do a session on that. And I said, well, let's just do a supplemental session. It can be as long as we want, and we'll just talk, and it'll be supplemental to the OT with TA. She said, great. So we're gonna do that. I'll have more specific dates for you, but, or more specific times for you, but that's gonna be this Saturday. So I don't know what your Saturday plans are, but it'll be in the afternoon sometime, probably sometime around one or two mountain time. And then of course, we'll also do an OT with DA. So I don't know what your Sabbath plans are, but we're gonna be creating additional supplemental materials. I'm also gonna be reaching out to several other friends of mine that I have, I really wanna try and bring them in. They're not always going to be able to be live here in the studio, but we can do it via Zoom. We can record it, capture it, and then upload it to the YouTube channel. All right. So I think that's all the announcements that I had. We are going to get into chapter two. Welcome everybody, so glad you're here. And uh, a name just popped up that I was gonna say hello to, but I don't know how to pronounce it, so apologies there. We're gonna start with prayer. Today we are in day two, chapter one, why was sin permitted? And this chapter in the whole, not just of Patriarchs and Prophets, but in the whole of all five volumes of the Conflict of the Ages series is arguably the most important chapter. I mean, that's a big claim, but it certainly is the chapter that I've read more than any other. I read it again today two more times, and there are such big ideas here, such cosmic ideas of justice and freedom and theodicy that we could spend, as I said in one of my Instagram posts, we could spend a month on this chapter alone, one month on this chapter. And obviously we're not going to do that, but I did take copious notes in my journal. Let me just show you that here. Used my journal for the first time, my Types and Symbols PP journal, Patriarchs and Prophets. And have a look at this. That, my friends, is a thing of beauty. Okay, look at that. Absolutely filled out. And I got this idea. It's maybe a little cheesy, but I'm gonna try it. You tell me if you think it's a good idea. I'm just gonna take a picture of my journal and then I'll, upload it to my Instagram account the next day. So I will take a picture of that, what my notes were, and I'll upload it. And if you wanna look at it, you can look at it. If you don't wanna look at it, no problem. But look at that, that's a lot of material. And then if I could show you my chapter, that was similarly well marked. Let me just show you the first page. Look at this, bam. Can you see that? Let's see, where's the light at? There it is. Okay, so very well marked up. We'll get into that in just a second. So let's start with prayer and dive into this singularly important chapter, the very first chapter of Patriarchs and Prophets, Why Was Sin Permitted? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we want to just pause and be mindful of the fact that the Holy Spirit not only inspired the text of Scripture, but can even now become the instructor in the text of Scripture. Father Jesus himself said of the Holy Spirit that when he comes, the Spirit of truth, he will guide us into all truth. And so, Father, we want to understand what it is that you're trying to teach us, and, and I want to make this distinction, Father. We want to understand not just intellectually and not just theologically, but, Father, individually, experientially, personally, where are those points of application? Where are those actionable steps since this is a devotional reading, a non-academic reading of the text, Lord, make the practical application paramount here and teach me how to, to communicate in such a way that the application is just right there on the surface. And so, Father, be with us now as we open this chapter and as we open the text of Scripture and as we open our minds to you, may you open yourself to us and disclose to us your beauty, your goodness, your justice, your love. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here we go. So what we did with DA with DA is uh, I would go kind of through the chapter and then at the end we would go through the rubric. And I think that's a good plan. I had a couple of people suggest starting with the rubric. If you think that's a really good idea, you can say so in the comments and, and let me know. Or if you think it's a great idea to end with the rubric and end with the word, uh, our, our word for the chapter, let me know. I'm, I'm, you know. We're just kind of making this up as we go and we're not concretized. We're not nailed down to any specific 
way of doing it. But, but for this particular session, I'm gonna go uh, and do it very similar to the way that we've already done it, all right? So let me get my chapter open here. Chapter one. All right. Just getting organized. And I'll get my journal open too. Okay. We're off to the races now, it looks like. Slide you over here. Okay, so chapter one of the Conflict of the Ages series, or The Conflict Beautiful, a name that I actually prefer, is as cosmic and as macro, as universal, as big as you can get. I mean, rather than starting right in Genesis 1 and 2, what Ellen White does is she goes earlier than that, even prior to, previous to, creation itself, which is our next chapter, right, the creation, she, she sets everything up, right? Going to set everything up that's going to follow, not just in the rest of Patriarchs and Prophets, but in the whole of the series. And that setup is one of the themes that we talked about last night. You might remember that we talked about the, well, I thought I had it here, the themes, the major themes that, that are consistent in the writings of Ellen White, and one of them was the Great Controversy theme. And so Ellen White's going to set that up here in this chapter and describe how it is that the world that we see around us today, a world that is fraught with pain and suffering and evil and injustice, how did that world come to be if, in fact, as Scripture declares, God is so amazing and so good? And so the chapter is titled, provocatively enough, Why Was Sin Permitted? Right, Getting right to the heart of the issue why was sin permitted? And you can understand why this would be necessary to do, or I think it was a very wise move to do, because as soon as we get to Genesis chapter 3, which is the fall, the temptation and the fall, we're introduced to this character, the serpent, and he's subtle, and he's, he's tempting Eve, and Adam and Eve fall, and there's really no preamble there. When Moses writes in Genesis, there is the assumption that his readers know what he's talking about, that they're familiar with this serpent and who he is and what he's doing there and where he came from. So what Ellen White does, I think very wisely, is she starts not right in creation, that's chapter two, she starts just before creation and sets up this larger cosmic picture and narrative of what we just call kind of colloquially the great controversy or this, this great conflict motif between God and, as we saw in our chapter today, uh, an angel, right? A, an otherwise um, beautiful, intelligent, perfectly created angel that, in the words of Ellen White, perverts his freedom and rebels against the goodness and governance of God, okay? So that's the backdrop here. And uh, let, let's get right into this. What I think I'll do is I'll just sort of scan over the chapter and highlight the things that really popped out to me and then we'll go back over the rubric. And again, I, I want to be extremely clear here. We are only going to be able to cover in the most you know, surface fashion the depth that's on offer here in this chapter. It, when I say that we could spend a month in this chapter, that's not an exaggeration. It's not. We, we could be in this chapter for a very long time. So we're going we're gonna to go over it. I'm going to highlight. I've written down here you know, five or six, maybe seven points that I want to bring out. Then we'll do the rubric. Okay, so the first thing I want you to notice, and this is very cool and I think very purposeful, and that is that the chapter title is a question, right? So why was sin permitted? There's an interrogative, there's a question, and notice the very first sentence of the entire book, of the entire series. She quotes from 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, God is love, and I want you to think about that. That's the answer to the question, right? In fact, what I did in my... In my book here is on this chapter where it says, why was sin permitted? I just wrote the word, I just wrote the word question here, right? Why was sin permitted? And then on the next page right here, I just wrote, I highlighted God is love and I wrote the word answer. I mean, that's really it. Everything that follows in the rest of chapter one is a disclosure and unfolding of that answer, right? The question is, why was sin permitted? And here's your answer because God is love. That's it. It's right there. Now, 
I fully recognize that to a lot of people, they would say, whoa, 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 how is that an answer to that question? How is God is love the answer to the question of why was sin permitted? Well, that's what she then goes on to explain and to um, disclose in the chapter, okay? So the sort of first mm, several paragraphs talk about God's law, his nature, uh, his love. In fact, I'll just read there the, the first few sentences. God is love, his nature, his law is love. Not merely loving, which would be an adjective describing a characteristic or behavior. Not merely that God is loving, but that God is love, right? That is a, a, a formal equivalence, right? Because love is a noun and God is a noun. God is love is a much bigger, more magnanimous and more expansive statement than merely saying God is loving. See, you and I, we can be loving. You might say, David is a loving husband, and David is a loving father, and I could say, Violetta is a loving wife, but I would not say, Violetta is love. Okay, do you, do you feel the difference there? The point that John is driving at, and Ellen White purposefully captures that sort of meta-theme of Scripture, is that the equivalence here is that God in His very nature, God in His very essence, is love. Again, not merely loving, but love itself. And in case that's unclear, the second sentence makes it abundantly clear. His nature, his law is love. His nature is love. Not just his conduct, not just his characteristics, not just his behavior. No, his nature is love. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But the sort of short version here is, and my good friend Ty Gibson has written a book on this, just last year called The Heavenly Trio. If you don't have that book, you should get a copy of it. And what Ty explains in there is this idea that, that because of the plurality inherent in the nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because God is not a singularity, but a unity, and the difference is incredible. I'll say it again. God is not a singularity, but a unity. Then you have this relational dynamic and this relational integrity that we could simply refer to as covenant. God is covenantal love in his very nature. The heart of the Father going out to the Son and the Spirit. The heart of the Spirit going out to the Father and the Son. And the heart of the Son going out to the Father and the Spirit. There is this covenantal familial connection. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into the creation chapter. So one of the things that jumped out to me in this chapter was these very interesting phrases that just come in like rapid fire succession in the first few pages that highlight sort of in, in, in different ways, like slightly different facets of this idea that God is love. And let me just read you these phrases. In my uh, uh, Patriarchs and Prophets here, I put a square or a box around every one of these phrases and then highlighted it. Here are those phrases. The first and most obvious one, God is love. And then his nature is love. The next paragraph, infinite love. Okay, then the paragraph that begins the history of the great conflict, which is just after the lengthy quotation of Psalm 89, God's unchanging love. Okay, I'm turning the page now. The law of love, the chapter, uh, one of the chapters begins in that same chapter, the service of love, the allegiance of love, and then on the next page, infinite love. Okay. Uh, clearly, clearly she is driving at a point here to use these phrases, infinite love, the allegiance of love, service of love, law of love, nature of love, God's unchanging love. All of this is an unpacking, an exploration of this idea that God in his very nature, in his very essence is love. And that's how the chapter opens. Then she transitions to talk about how God is not a rigid numerical singularity, but he is a unity and she introduces Christ. And what I did in my margin here is I just wrote Christ uh, right in the margin of the, of the paragraph that begins, the sovereign of the universe was not alone. Ah, there it is, right? That's what paragraph one, two, three, four, five. Paragraph five, the sovereign of the universe was not alone. Say it with me, not alone. And so I highlighted that. And here we have this, we're beginning to be introduced to this notion of the plurality of God, even... Uh, in, in sort of burgeoning fashion here, in sort of developmental fashion, 
the triunity of God, right? That he was not alone. And, and that has resonances, which we'll talk more about tomorrow, with it is not good that mankind should be alone. Well, why not? Well, because mankind is made in the image of God, and God in his very nature, God in his very essence, is not alone. Even before there was any created thing, before there was an angel, before there was a human, before there was a giraffe, before there was a hippopotamus, God was never alone because his nature is familial. His nature is community. His nature is social. And so she introduces Jesus. And one of the things I want to say is because there are sometimes questions about this with regards to, oh, you're a Seventh-day Adventist. What do you believe about Jesus? And and questions of Christology come into, you know, people say, I don't know anything about Seventh-day Adventists. Are you those people that believe that Jesus was created, that, that Jesus is a creature of some kind? And the answer is absolutely not. I mean, in this book, in this par uh, chapter, Ellen White could not be clearer. In that same paragraph there that begins with the sovereign of the universe, this is on page 33 of the uh, uh, Conflict Beautiful pagination and 34 of the original, Listen to this. It says, um, she introduces Jesus. He was in the beginning with God. Christ the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the eternal Father. One in nature, one in character, one in purpose. Okay, that's unambiguous and it's unequivocal. That is as high a Christology as we've ever seen in the whole of Orthodox Christianity. Jesus is not created. He's not uh, an ontological subordinate. No, he's one with the Father. What does she say? In nature, in character, in purpose. And the most important one there for our purposes is in nature. One in nature. This is the very thing that, of course, Jesus was driving at in John chapter 10, verse 30, when he said, I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. We'll do the math on that. I and my Father, looks like two, are one. Again, not a numerical singularity, but a unity. Okay, the same thing that's being driven at, she quotes here John 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 1, 2, and the Word was God. Okay, we'll talk more about this in the creation chapter, but I'm just walking you through what she does. So she opens with the law of love, then she gets into Jesus, and everything is going swimmingly well. And talk about being steeped in Scripture. This was one of the features we talked about uh, of Ellen White's thematic features of Ellen White's writing is scriptural primacy, pointing people back to the text, back to the text, back to the text. And so just on page pages one and two, these are the scriptural you know, uh, references. Isaiah 57, Habakkuk 3, James 1, Psalm 89, Isaiah 9, John 1, Micah 5, Proverbs 8, and Colossians 1. I and mean, that's in two pages. I mean, come on, clearly... The woman was versed in scripture, she was passionate about scripture, and um, based at least on these first few pages, she understood scripture. High Christology, high view of the love of God, the beauty of God, the sovereignty of God. Okay, turning the page now, the very next big theme that we're introduced to is the idea of freedom, and the importance of this cannot be overstated, okay? Freedom, let me just read you, this is the uh, paragraph that begins... So long as all created beings acknowledged, so this is page 34 of Types and Symbols and 35 in the original pagination. If you uh, just followed uh, kind of down to about midway through that paragraph, it says, but a change came over this happy state, describing the sort of heavenly angelic state, the pre-sin state. She says, a change came over. Oh, well, what was the change? She says, a change came over this happy state. There was one who perverted the freedom that God had granted his creatures. There's our word, freedom. That's the operative word that she introduces here. And let me just take a moment here to explain why love and freedom are indissolubly connected, right? Inexorably connected, okay? And that goes something like this. And I'll just go over this very quickly. And if you lose it, you can get it on my Instagram page, you can see a picture of it in the notes. But four steps, four simple steps, and they go like this. Number one, love requires freedom. Number two, freedom involves risk. Three, risk entails responsibility. And four, responsibility enables growth. Now, let's just talk about the first one. Love requires freedom. Ellen White understood this, right? 
we, you and I understand this just intuitively. We just get it. It makes sense. If, if somebody's going to love, they have to be free to love. If you force someone to love, if you force intimacy, that's an ugly thing. And we actually have a really ugly word for that. We call it rape. Okay, so when, when this beautiful, happy, harmonious, heavenly scene is being painted with God as the sovereign over the angelic realm, she highlights freedom. In fact, in the paragraph just before that, she says things like this. God desires from all his creatures the service of love, service that springs from an appreciation of his character. He takes no pleasure in a forced obedience. To all he grants freedom of will that they may render him voluntary service. Bam, there you go. So just moving through the chapter and sort of the big macro pictures, we go from God's nature is love to uh, the, the high Christology, that God was not alone, and then bam, right into freedom. Okay, well that then sets up what I was just reading a moment ago, that the perversion of freedom takes place. And that's exactly what she says. There was one who perverted the freedom that God had granted to his creatures. Now, what this tells us, just to make the obvious observation here, if, if the freedom that was granted was such that it could be perverted and could be used in rebellion, well, then that alerts us to the fact that it is an actual freedom. It, it's, it's not a false freedom. It's not the veneer of freedom. It doesn't just cosmetically look like freedom. It's freedom. To use an analogy here, I have, I have two sons. And if I give my sons, say, some money, let's say I just recently transferred one of my sons some money. So I transfer him that money and I say to him, my oldest son, I say, okay, so Landon, this money needs to last you for a certain period of time. Spend it wisely. Well, he has his own account. I, I don't have access to his account and I don't, I don't need to have access to his account. I trust him with that money. He is free to, I, I do not know how he spends that money, but I trust him and I give him freedom. If it was not real freedom, I would be monitoring. I would say, hey, Landon, just a question. How did you spend that money? Uh, did you spend any money today? What did you buy? Why did you buy that? How, why didn't you buy something else? Why are you spending money on that? Man, you're spending a lot of the money I gave you. Well, that's not, that's not freedom. And then let's take it even a step further. Let's say that I actually had access to his account such that the moment he started to use his money in ways that I didn't like or sign off on, I took all the money back out of the account. He could rightfully say, yeah, but dad, you gave me that money. That, that, that money was for me. I thought that was my money. And I would say, yeah, yeah, that's only your money as long as you use it in the way I want you to use it. To which he could justifiably reply and consistently reply and say, well, then, that's, then it's not my money. It's still just your money and you're spending it through me. And it's only my money to the degree that I spend it in harmony with your wishes. Freedom is a very good analog here. Money is a very good analog for freedom. We are alerted to the fact that the freedom that was granted to all of God's creatures, that God takes creaturely freedom so seriously that the freedom that was granted was sufficiently robust that, that it could be perverted, that rebellion could emerge even in this otherwise happy state. And the rest of the chapter is the telling of that tale. The rest of the chapter tells psychologically and even sequentially how that happened. Now, I want to say a few things here about that. First of all, time does not allow us in our DA with DA to go on a deep dive into the sequence that's, that's described here or the psychology that's described here, though I find it really persuasive. In fact, uh, as I've mentioned before, I've read this chapter, I don't know, probably, I don't know, like 30 or 40 times. I don't know how many times I've read it, dozens of times. I read it twice just today. I wouldn't be surprised if I've read it a hundred times, right? So, and when I read this chapter and I had the same experience again today, I get this almost, I get chills, honestly. I, I feel like I'm getting access, like I'm looking in through a window. I'm peering in to see something that if it wasn't specifically revealed to me, I would have no way of knowing. You could never intuit what's described in chapter one from looking at the birds and the mountains and the grass and the animals. You could say that God is good. You could say that God is creator, but you could never intuit all of this, this deep sort of sequential psychological tale that is painted here in this chapter. And 
I find it extremely persuasive. I find it not only persuasive, I find it incredibly sad. And every time I read it, I, I just feel like I'm watching a car crash in slow motion. I know what's going to happen. It's like something I've seen over and over again. I know what's going to happen, but every time I read it, I think maybe this time it won't happen. Maybe it'll be different this time. And every time it goes exactly the same way. And, and Ellen White describes in incredible detail, she uses phrases like this. I'll just read you a few of the phrases. And this is actually on page 35. She uses phrases like little by little, the desire for self-exaltation. He was not content. He coveted the glory. He aspired for power. These jealousy of Christ, these, these little hints, these little phrases that alert us as to what's taking place psychologically inside of Lucifer's mind in this rebellion. Now, a word on that. There is no explanation here in terms, there, there is no sequential explanation. No good reason can be given for Lucifer's rebellion because if a reason could be given, then it could be excusable, right? It has been said, and I like this, if, if Lucifer's rebellion could be explained in a rational sequential way, it could be excused. But it is causeless. It is irrationality. In fact, it's irrational. In fact, you could say that Lucifer's rebellion is a form of insanity, that sin is a form of insanity. It's, it's basically a distrust of a being, God, who's given, never given us any reason to not trust him. And so she paints this incredible picture here. And one of the words that emerges, and I don't know if you noticed this, but but one of the key words that occurs some, I think I wrote it down here, occurs eight times and a synonym occurs one time is the word superiority. Superiority or the word supreme. That, that Jesus occupied a position because of his nature, his ontological oneness with God. And, and yet Lucifer desired superiority. He refused to recognize the superiority of Christ, the supremacy of Christ. Um, that word supremacy is an extremely important word in this chapter, and it comes up again and again and again. Now, I just want to spend a moment highlighting one of the most revelatory aspects of this chapter, and that is this idea that in order to sort of mitigate the, the increasing dissatisfaction of Lucifer, God calls a heavenly council. Now, we don't have any textual example of this specific council that I'm aware of. There are intimations of it in places like Job and Revelation, but, but the specific detail that's given here is, frankly, a revelation. It, we wouldn't know this specific detail without what we have here in Patriarchs and Prophets. And so the idea here is that God convenes a heavenly council, and what he does is he explains the position of Jesus relative to himself. And the reason for that is that the, the, uh, apparently the gravamen or the point or the locus of Lucifer's concern was the supremacy of Jesus, the exaltation of Jesus, the position of Jesus. And that looks apparently something like this. Jesus was able to enter into the counsels of God the Father. And, and, Lucifer's looking around and he's realizing that he's an exalted angel and he starts to ask the question, the discontented question, hey, why don't I get access? Why can't I get into those councils? And that's where the rebellion begins. Again, it, it cannot be fully explained, but what Satan does do, Lucifer, I should say, he's not yet in full-blown satanic rebellion. So what Lucifer does do is he leverages, this is key, he leverages the natural mysteriousness, the natural mystery that is God. And he leverages that in such a way that he suggests to the angels that what's, quote, behind the curtain, on the other side of the curtain, is not beautiful and loving and kind and just and good. It's actually self-serving. And this exaltation of Jesus is actually an injustice. It's a kind of favoritism. And uh, it's unfair to Lucifer, and by implication, it's unfair to all the rest of the angels. So that's, that's the charge, right? Sort of an embryonic form. Well, here's an interesting thing. Think that through for just a minute. In order for that charge to gain any kind of traction at all, and, and that traction is described, again, 
in passages, you know, embryonically in passages that she quotes in places like Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, uh, Genesis 3, Revelation 12. We're not going deep into the sort of scriptural evidence here. But think about that for just a moment. And I'm just going to say this, and if you get it, you get it. And if you don't, I'm sorry. In order for Lucifer to even have the idea that he could be on some kind of equal footing with Jesus, then Jesus must have looked angelic. You follow that? Jesus must have looked sufficiently angelic. He must have looked sufficiently creaturely that, that Satan could raise or Lucifer could raise the accusation. He could say, hey, what about that angel? How come that angel gets access? How come that angel gets, how come there's a, an apparent favoritism, a prioritization here of that angel above, for example, me and the other angels? You, you, you feel that? Now, again, the only way this gets any traction at all is if Jesus was sufficiently creaturely looking to cause that to seem plausible, right? So this heavenly council is convened, and this is the coolest point. The heavenly council is convened, and, and she says, this is on page 36, uh, the king of the universe summoned the heavenly hosts before him, and that whole chapter describes this heavenly council, and this is basically what happens. God the Father discloses to the angelic host the nature of Jesus, the position of Jesus. He basically says, look, this is so cool. Listen to how I'm going to say this. He basically says this. Okay, let me clear something up here. Because apparently some think this is not sufficiently clear. So let me make this abundantly clear. Jesus is not an angel going up into my presence in some privileged, you know, unjust prioritization. No, Jesus is not an angel going up. Jesus is God coming down. Feel that. That's what he said. That's what takes place. And all of the angels go, oh, of course, this makes so much sense now. And, and just a brief little word on that. This is so cool. Because when it comes time for Jesus, who is the word, right? In the beginning was the word. We've quoted that already in John 1. The word there that's translated word is the Greek word logos. It's the same word that we use when we use words like biology. Biology is biologos, the word about life, or uh, let's say uh, anthropology. So anthropos logos, the word about mankind. Geology, geologos, the word about the earth. Jesus is the logos, and this is the amazing thing. When Jesus comes as the logos, as the word, as the intent, the loving intent of God to humanity, how does he come? How does he come? He does not come as an angel. He comes as a human being, right? In, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You move down just a few verses, John chapter one, verse 14, and the word became flesh. So now just think that through. I'll, I'll make it very simple. When it came time for God to communicate to human beings, right, in this most intimate and accessible of ways, God became a human being in Christ. So to humans, Jesus, the Logos, the Word, is a human. Well, what then is Jesus, the Logos, the Word, God in very nature, to angels? Well, apparently, he was an angel. Or he was at least sufficiently angelic looking that the, the accusation of Lucifer got sufficient traction for it to sound at least plausible. So God convenes this heavenly council and he says, okay, let me explain. Okay, there's been some misunderstanding. I want perfect transparency, perfect honesty, perfect openness in my governance. And here's what's going on. Jesus Christ is my son. He's one in nature with me. He is not an angel going up, you know, in an unjust, privileged, favoritism, access to me. No, he's God coming down to you. And then I can just imagine the minds of all the angels are like, Pow! but it's not just that their minds are blown. It also makes a lot of sense. Of course. 
yeah, Jesus, uh, it, it, and it's clicking for everybody. And this is the key, and she unpacks this. It clicks for Lucifer too. She described, it clicks for him too. She actually says that he became persuaded that he was wrong. He, he was persuaded that he had misunderstood, that he had misapprehended the situation. I'll just read a, a few pages to that effect here. Um, on page 39, it says uh, about midway down the paragraph there, his disaffection was proved to be without cause and Lucifer was made to see what would be the result of persisting in revolt. And then this line, Lucifer was convinced that he was in the wrong. Okay, there we go. That's what I mean when I say this rebellion is perfectly irrational. If, and we've all been there. Every one of us have been there where we have thought something about maybe someone or about a situation or about a circumstance, and then facts are presented to us. And we go, yeah, I, I guess I was wrong. But it's hard for us to do that sometimes. And so sometimes instead of humbling ourselves and saying, yeah, I totally misread that situation. I'm so sorry. I misunderstood. I made a mistake. Often what we do, too often what we do is we double down and we refuse to admit that we were wrong even when the evidence is in front of us. That Lucifer was persuaded that he was wrong. It was clear. Jesus wasn't an angel going up. He was God coming down. He was the logos between God and the angels because the chasm that separates the creator from the created is in seemingly unbridgeable chasm, right? The difference between God, the creator, the great I am, the, the illimitable, ineffable, eternal God, and any creature, even an angel that excels in strength, is an infinite chasm. So Jesus bridges that chasm. And so God explains this. He's like, hey, hey, this isn't favoritism. In fact, this is the opposite. This is incredible condescension. God clothing himself with a sufficiently angelic garb to come down and mingle among you such that you're like, oh, he's one of us. He's one of, that's just like Jesus did when he came to earth. He's the Logos. Jesus is the Logos. And I like to think, you know, as a, as a nature lover and as a bird lover, that Jesus is not only the, the Logos from the creator to the created in the angelic realm and in the human realm, but, but what if Jesus was a sparrow to the sparrows, right? What if he was a lion to the lion and an elephant to the elephants? Like clearly all of these beautiful creatures have a way of communicating with one another and understanding one another. God? What if God wanted to reveal himself in sparrowly ways or elephant-like way? I mean, that's just such a, it's, it's a little conjecture and I grant that, but it makes a lot of sense. It's so cool to think that God condescends from his eternal ontological position to communicate to us in ways that we can be like, yeah, yeah. I mean, think about this just, just very quickly. When Jesus was sitting at the table with people, eating a meal, right, as we read in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, nobody sitting there understood fully, oh yeah, that guy, that guy that's sitting across the table with the brown hair and the brown eyes and the, you know, the calloused hands, that guy, oh yeah, that's God. Oh yeah, that's the infinite, eternal, illimitable, that's God right there. Because he was so like them. He was so accessible. Now let's think this through. The very purpose of words is to communicate, right? I'm using words right now to communicate. We read this book so that we could have Ellen White communicate to us. And if words are not understandable, if they're not accessible, then they lose their purpose. The purpose is communication. Jesus was understandable. Jesus was accessible. He didn't just remain on some divine perch high in the heavens, inaccessible to us, unknowable to us. No, he became a human being. And apparently what took place there in the sort of embryonic stages of the Luciferian rebellion was Lucifer said, oh yeah, I see what's going on here. This is an injustice. This is unfair. There is a favoritism here. There, there is a supremacy here that is, is sufficiently dangerous that it could threaten all of us. It could threaten the whole cosmos. And God's like, no, no, no. This is all a giant misunderstanding. Let me explain it to you. So he gathers the angelic host together 
explains what I've been explaining here, that he's not an angel come, going up, he's God coming down, and everybody goes, of course. Of course. It makes so much sense. And Lucifer was persuaded. I love this point she makes. He was convinced. He knew he was wrong. The evidence was right there in front of him. And then, rather than humbling himself, admitting that he was wrong, this is the full-blown launching of the great controversy. He doubles down. He doubles down. And that's why it's irrational. She actually says that Lucifer's rebellion was shown to be without cause. Without cause. Now, here's a really cool little philosophical point. There are only two things in the universe without cause that don't have an antecedent cause. Number one is God. God has no ontological cause. God is the I am. He always has been. He is, right? Nothing caused God. Nothing was before God. He, he was and he is and he always will be, right? He's the Alpha and the Omega. So God is without an ontological cause. And sin, rebellion, disobedience is without a rational cause. There is no rationality. There is no line. There is no sequence that you can follow. A, B, C, D, rebellion. Nope. It makes no sense. It's perfectly illogical. And that's what makes the rebellion of Lucifer a form of insanity. Okay. So one, a couple other things I want to highlight here, and then we'll get into the rubric because I'm already going a little long. This is one of the biggest chapters though. I mean, this is huge. Did you notice as I did, I'm on page 39, all of the dis words and by dis, D-I-S, D-I-S. So the, the prefix, the Latin prefix dis means like the opposite of, right? To, so, so to engage is to right, join yourself to something, to link yourself to something, to disengage is the opposite of that. It's to back away from something. Okay, so that, that, that prefix dis is hugely on display here. Let me just read this to you. So um, she talks about the spirit of discontent. And now I'm on page 38. Let me just read you these words. Discontent, discerned, dissent, dissatisfaction, distorting, discontent, dissatisfaction, disaffected, discord, dissatisfaction, discontented, dissatisfied, disaffected, dissension, discord, disaffected, dismiss, disaffection, 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 discord, disaffection. I mean, what's going on here? All of these dis words are designed to create the sense of discord and discontent and dissatisfaction. He orients himself, Lucifer, in hostility against God, against his government, and against his goodness. Now, we have to just make this point before we get to the rubric. Right at the end of the chapter, Ellen White describes how God will address this rebellion, how he will address this creation, this what, what John the Revelator calls in Revelation chapter 12, war broke out in heaven. War broke out in heaven. And what I wrote here in the margin on page 43 is I just wrote down the wheat and the tares. The wheat and the tares. This very situation is described by Jesus in parabolic form in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30, and then 36 to 43, where Jesus tells the parable of the wheat and the tares. The landowner that, that plants seeds and, and the he puts good seeds in his field, but then an enemy comes in and sows weeds among. And, and then when they both grow up together, the idea by the laborers is, hey, we should root up all of the weeds. And, and the landowner says, no, you, you can't. Because if you did that now in this early stage, right, this early developmental stage, you might actually root up some of the good stuff with some of the bad stuff. And he says you have to let both grow together until the harvest, until some final consummation, and until the end when things will be fully fruited and fully mature and we'll see them for what they are. Now, a key point on that. When the laborers first recognize that something doesn't look quite right, hey, you're a good landowner. You planted good seed. This doesn't line up. And they came to him and they said to him, did you sow? We thought you sowed good seed in your field. Implicit in that question is, are you somehow responsible for the appearance of these weeds? You know that that's implicit because the answer that Jesus gives is what? An enemy has done this. This is Matthew chapter 13. 
And so the idea here that's communicated in the last few chapters, or the last few paragraphs rather, is that God will allow Satan to play out in sort of weed-like fashion, developmentally, the principles and the ideas that he's advocating for. And that is the great controversy. And everything that flows from there, the, the rest not only of Patriarchs and Prophets, but the rest of the entire Conflict of the Ages series, the whole record of Scripture is an unfolding of God's um, posture in dealing with evil and rebellion. In fact, listen to this. Listen to this. This is right back to the, to the opening of the, ch of the chapter. This is uh, paragraph 1, 2, 3, 4. Paragraph 4. Listen to this. Page 33. The history of the great conflict between good and evil from the time that it first began in heaven to the final overthrow of rebellion and the total eradication of sin is a demonstration of God's unchanging love. That's what we have in Scripture, ladies and gentlemen. That's what we're going to be studying through the rest of Patriarchs and Prophets. Literally, a catalog of God giving Lucifer, as it were, a canvas upon which to paint his picture, a field upon which to, a, a field in which to sow his, his plants. And then at the end, at the consummation, and this is what Jesus describes in Matthew chapter 13, we'll have a look, and, and there's this great point she makes, that Lucifer's own work will condemn him. It will not be artificial. It won't be God from the outside coming in. At, no, no. Lucifer's own decisions, his own fruits, his own actions, his own painting will condemn him in the eyes of the onlooking universe. So that's our chapter. And, it, and I've gone over, you know, there's tons of stuff here that I've had to leave out, you know, clearly because there's just too much. But let me just quickly look at my notes here and see uh, if there's anything else that I wanted to say. Um, got that, got that, got that, got that, got that. I guess I got most of it. So let's do the rubric then. Let's do the rubric. And this is where we go through the, the point, the, per, the point, the person, the prayer, the practice, and the promise. And as you can see right here, I've filled that out. I'm just going to read for you what I wrote down here. And again, I'll put a picture of this in my Instagram. Uh, you can look at it tomorrow. Okay. So it'll, it'll be a part of the Instagram uh, that I put up tomorrow morning. Okay. Here we go. What was the point of this chapter? Well, I said there was two points. There's a literary point and there's a theological point. Okay. So literarily, this chapter sets up everything that will follow in the rest of the series and in the rest of the book. Okay, that's number one. Number two, theologically, what this chapter does is introduces the great controversy, that is, the tension between the Luciferian rebellion and the goodness of God and the government of God, and it shows that God's love and God's goodness is the lens through which we are to view and understand ourselves, our world, and, of course, Scripture itself. So, it introduces us to a theological lens in the same way that I have my glasses here, my, my lenses that help me to see. This chapter is a lens, and Ellen White's saying here, you, everything you're going to read after this, I want you to read it through this lens. That's the point. Number two, the person. What do we learn about the person of God? Well, this is an obvious one, right? God is, say it with me, saints. God is love. And I wrote here, there are so many love phrases in this chapter. Remember, the allegiance of love and infinite love and his nature is love. All of those in those sort of first two or three pages. I wrote here, also God's commitment to creaturely freedom is indissolubly connected to his love. Ah, don't miss that. God's love is indissolubly, or I could, you can say it either way. God's love is indissolubly connected to his commitment to creaturely freedom, and God's commitment to creaturely freedom is indissolubly connected with his love. Remember those four points. Love requires freedom. Freedom involves risk. Risk entails responsibility, and responsibility enables moral growth. What do I mean by that? Responsibility enables moral growth. Well, we'll find out when we get to the chapter on the temptation, where God gives Adam and Eve an opportunity to exercise responsibility, to behave in a morally upright morally responsible way. And that would have enabled moral growth. 
In the app, back to my son, back, very quickly back to the illustration of my son. If I give my son $1,000 and he now has the opportunity to learn how to spend money in a responsible way, right? In a way that's in, in keeping with what's in his own best interest and what I'm hoping for him and what God wants for him. If he's never given that money, if he's never given that freedom, well, then how can he ever learn how to do something? And so hear it again. Love requires freedom. Freedom involves risk. Risk entails responsibility, and responsibility enables growth. Not physical growth, not growth in terms of stature, moral growth. And so that's what we learn about God. He is absolutely committed to creaturely freedom. In fact, he's so committed to creaturely freedom, he does so at the, at the expense, as we find out in the New Testament, of his own life. Whoo, okay, all right. Uh, the prayer. Here's my prayer. You ready? Father, help me and teach me how not to pervert the freedom you have so wisely and wonderfully given to me. That's my prayer. Father, teach me how not to pervert the freedom that you've given to me as Lucifer and his loyalists perverted theirs. Okay, number four, the practice. How do you practice this chapter? Now, this is kind of a big chapter sort of in terms of like big ideas and big theology, but, but here's how you practice the chapter. In my, this is what I came away with. I choose to choose truth and transparency over dishonesty and deception and lies. To be a person of integrity and also to be patient and to trust the process. That's a big one. What do we see here? I mean, think about this. Look, look at how many, look at how big that is, right? Look at all of those books there. That whole set of books there is basically an unpacking of the scriptural record, and it's long. It's long, and it's involved, and it's difficult, and it's thorny, and it's messy, and all of it tells us that God is patient. In fact, what is the very first thing that we learn about love in the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Love is patient. So that's one of the lessons here for me. God, teach me how to be patient and to trust the process. What do I mean by the process? To, to trust what you're doing in my life. To believe that you're doing something in me that's bigger than I can do for myself. And then finally, the promise. Okay, this is the promise Im implicit in those closing paragraphs there that God will ultimately be victorious, not primarily because of the strength of his nature or of his character, the strength of his nature or of his power, but because of the beauty and the loveliness of his character. Remember that line that we read that only the obedience that is voluntary, only the obedience that is, that is born out of an, of an affection, of a love for God is acceptable to him. And so God will be victorious, not just on the, the strength of his nature and of his power, but on the beauty of his character, the loveliness of his character. And so today is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Did you know that? Here in the United States of America, we celebrate the birthday that was uh, January 15th. We celebrate it as the third, uh, in the third week of January every year. The date changes a little bit, but Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday was January 15, and he was an amazing civil rights leader, an amazing figure. I've read many of his books, and my favorite, well, one of my favorite, top five all-time quotations from Martin Luther King Jr. is this quotation. He said famously that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. That is what is being described in this chapter. The, the arc of the, uh, that is so perfectly said, so homo, that's homiletical perfection. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. You could just as easily say it bends toward love. And that's my word. To me, this was a no brainer. There were a lot of words in there that could have been the word of the chapter, but in answer to the question, why was sin permitted? In answer to that question, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 is quoted. God is love. And he that loves God, and he that loves knows God, right? Like, it's just, I'm sure there were a lot of other great words out there. Let's see, people saying, 
Somebody says one, that's a great word, love. Victor Mills says, yep. Oh, supremacy, yeah, you noticed that too. Yeah, that was, that was, that was a word that absolutely popped out to me. Somebody says allegiance, benevolent. Love, says Jen, my word too, love. Love, freedom, great word. That's an excellent case can be made for that, Nancy. Wisdom, ooh, Marco says contest. Yeah, I see that. I see that. Freedom. Freedom. Long-suffering. Cassandra, great word. That's basically the... Think about the word patient. I don't know if you knew this or not, but the word, the root word of patient is the word suffer. Doctors see patience, right? And when we don't get what we want when we want, we have to exercise patience. The root word in Latin is to suffer. And so when the Bible refers to God's long suffering, another way to say that is God's patience. And I actually wrote in my journal, love is patient. And that's what we see, that God is going to go with the process, that he's going to allow Lucifer's own work, that he's going to allow Satan's own rebellion to condemn him. He commits himself to a long, and for God especially, deeply painful process and he does so because he is love. In his very nature, in his very essence, say it with me, God is love. All right, well, that is our second session of OT with DA. I've got a few other little things I was gonna tell you about these two books, but I'll do that uh, in a future session. God bless you all. We're gonna close with prayer. We're on tomorrow, don't forget. 6 p.m. Mountain Time. So one hour later than we were today. If you can't make the live, no problem. If you can't make the live, no problem. So glad we had, uh, looks like 600 people uh, on the live. If you can't make the live, no problem. When the times shift, I recognize it can be tricky to you know get it. We will get more consistency later uh, when we sort of get in a bit of a rhythm here. But for now, if you can't make the live, no problem. You can get it on the YouTube channel. We'll upload it usually within an hour or two of the program. So we're going to close with prayer. Thank you all for joining. And I hope this has been a blessing to you. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about creation. Father in heaven, we just pause here to recognize that if what is described in this chapter is accurate, if what is described in this chapter is true, Father, it's amazing. I mean, it, there could be no greater good news than that there is a God and he is love in his very nature, in his very essence. Father, help us to be patient people. Help us to be trusting people. Help us to be free people. Father, yesterday in the introduction, we talked about briefly the, the joy and freedom of obedience. Father, teach us how to use our freedom, not to misuse it, not to pervert it. Father, that's my prayer. And I want to pray for every single person that's a part of OTDA, OT with DA, Father, there's people that are hurting, there's people that are doing well, there's people that are struggling, there's people that are, that are learning and seeking. Father, you know every circumstance, every situation, every person. And I just pray that every one of them would have a, uh, an incredible infilling experience in OT with DA, that, that we would come out the other side and we would say, truly, God met with us during those 75 days. Uh, we love you, Father, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.